Oh, yeah, that's right. I like Nutter Butter cookies. Come, come at me. Come at me. It's healthy snack day around the office. Nutter Butters that are delicious, but I know they're bad for me. And a nice, healthy, no sugar, delicious strawberry spindrift. Mm. Spring has officially sprung. Nutter Butters and strawberry soda. Welcome everybody to another edition of AZ Cook's Instagram Live edition. No, 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 no. We are not making Nutter Butters today. We're going to show you some incredible, absolutely vital, hands-on learning technique that is going to up your food game spectacularly. Uh, what better ingredient to focus on today than a true spring grass-fed leg of lamb, superb. And we're gonna show you a whole bunch of cool things uh, that you can do with this. And uh, of course, none of this would be possible without our sponsors, the good people at Shun, my knife of choice, and our friends at uh, Florida Kanya, our rum of choice here at World Headquarters. Hey, spring is in the air, right? Easter Sunday is coming up. We've posted some really cool recipe bundles on our website with all kinds of, I mean, 20 different <laughs> inspirations and recipes and links to all sorts of other things. We got your spring taken care of. Um, so a lot of people take a, a leg like this and they buy it. And by the way, this is a spring lamb, which means it came from a, an animal that was, uh, I think the rule a couple years ago went from nine months to now 12 months or younger. Um, but you can tell by the size, it's a, it's a young leg of lamb. It's beautiful. It's gonna be stunning to eat. You can see the different colors and all the different muscles in there. I think I learned about 400 years ago in, in the one day that I attended culinary school, there's like eight muscles in there. It's not just the top round, which is at the top of uh, the thigh. And obviously here is the shank. Um, they did a nice job and removed the hoof for us. Um, but I, I do save my shanks. Uh, when, when I buy legs of lamb, because no matter how I roast it, there's a lot of tendon and stuff going through there. And even though I'll picket it and make some little uh, snacks for myself in the kitchen, in general, if I save my shanks in the freezer, I get four or six of them and make a great lamb shank dish or tagine or something like that. Um, but this time of year, uh, fresh spring lamb comes into the market, it rises in price, and then next week it's just gonna crash in price because they will have butchered a lot of lambs and they never sell as many as they think they do. So what I do is I buy a couple of whole legs of lamb on sale. I like to get them on the bone because when I roast them on the bone, they have much better flavor. The recipe that uh, we actually put out this morning on IG for my roasted leg of lamb that I do on the rack in the oven with a pan beneath it to catch the drippings with a Greek sauce called avgo lemono, uh, an egg and lemon sauce, is the way I most frequently cook lamb, roasted whole on the bone, whether it's in the oven or on the grill, it's just a fantastic way to do it. But I'll always get a couple extra legs and bone them out because the meat of the leg is so much cheaper when you buy whole legs, but it's also so much cheaper than the loins and the chops. And I happen to love lamb. Uh, my kid loves lamb. And I remember him, uh, you know, trying his first rack of lamb and I cut them, you know, into chops. And of course I scraped the edges down a little so that he could eat them a little easier when he hold them by the bone. It's lamb lollipops, right? So he would ask for them all the time and I would go to the market and I order two racks of lamb. They're like $40 each, it's insane. So th the idea is that it's very inexpensive and rather than cooking all of it together, which is great sometimes to roast for several hours, I often butcher the different muscles out of there and grill them for onesies, twosies, threesies, whatever I do. I can grill a little piece and put it in a pita bread and throw in some hot sauce and tahini and have a delicious sandwich right for lunch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bone out this uh, leg of lamb for you and show you the, the general process. I'm gonna grill some back here uh, over binchotan. I think this is gonna be really, really cool. The first thing that I wanna do 
uh, is just start anywhere you're comfortable and just start removing all of the surface silver skin that you can find. Now, I save this fat because sometimes I'll confit uh, in it. I also don't like to throw away anything. So if I make a penetration that's a little deep, I'll usually cut it away like this because guess what all of this scrap means? When I get a pound or two of all of these pieces of lamb with a little bit of connective tissue on them, but from where I went a little too deep with the knife, that's what I'll use for soups or stews or grind it up into lamb burgers or uh, whatever. Put it on skewers. When you make your first cut on the lamb, and I love showing people this, you will see the different muscles reveal themselves almost instantly. Okay? So you have this big piece of round here you have, which has one kind of marbling, that it's a very dense, dense uh, muscle on the leg. And then you have a very fibrous muscle. You can almost see how different those fibers are. I can almost pull the protein apart. Do you see when I do that, those fibers reveal themselves? That almost eats more like a skirt steak, right? Even though it's on the leg and not in the belly of the animal. So what I wanna do is just remove these pieces of fat from here and separate the muscles. Then once they're se separated, I can trim them up, right? So let's see where this one takes us, right? And just like cutting uh, chicken legs from chicken thighs, whoops, just like cutting chicken legs from chicken thighs, I like to let the lamb, you see that line there? You don't have to guess at all. I'm just gonna peel that, right? And just take this piece of silver skin off. And the more of that silver skin that I remove, it shows me where the end of that muscle is, right? You have a preferred muscle? Uh, well, I'm going to show you that I do. Of course I do. I have an opinion on everything. Don't, haven't you figured that out by now? And you can use your fingers to just spread this away. You don't have to use the knife. I'm just using my fingers here. And then you get to a place where there's some tougher sinew and you wanna separate it. And you just let the lamb do the talking for you. I could almost pull this off myself. I'm gonna be a little more elegant and cut it, right? And I have this, I've actually got two different muscles here, right? I have this one right here and then this little guy that hitched along for the ride. And I'm just gonna separate this right where that piece of silver skin is and just cut this way. And I actually have three muscles here. Well, let's put this aside for a second. Then I've got essentially two other big muscles on here, top and bottom round. How much does it weigh? I think this whole thing probably started at like five or six pounds. Madeline, do you remember? Madeline doesn't remember. I remember. She was busy. She was busy while she was shopping. Uh, I think about five or six pounds. Um, I will go through all of this trim later on. You see, you get pieces like this that have a big piece of fat there, which is fine, fat's flavor, but that connective tissue, that's a really serious piece of sinew. So I'm just gonna take that and set that aside, knowing that I'm gonna come back to that. And I'll, I usually wind up with a leg with about a pound, pound and a half of little pieces of trim, little nuggets from other parts of the, uh, the leg that I can grind or use for another purpose. Now, see this line? I'm just gonna rub my fingers into that, make it a little more apparent. When you see a line like that, it usually means 
there's something going on in there, right? There's a different muscle, right? Those lines are where the muscles connect. So I have one here. And look at where, look at where this is leading me. Let's take off, always take off the silver skin. If you don't want to use your knife, just peel away silver skin, right? And once you do this on the bottom, I think this is the easiest way to teach people how to do this because you're only going to do this a couple of times a year if, and you may only do this one time a year, right? So I'm just going to cut away the fat and sinew on this. I'm trying to do it backwards in some places so I don't lose your attention. But you can see here where this muscle here, and I can grip it, sort of meets up with this big piece on top, right? So let's take all that off and see what we get. Cut that off. This is a cut from the hip, right? That's where the H bone is, where it intercepts with the, the spine. I'm just gonna cut this whole thing off. It has eight or nine different <laughs> little small muscles in there. So this is great while something is cooking to just slice the silver skin off and use that meat to go into my pile here of nice little trim pieces that I'm going to use for stew or grinding for myself, right? Okay. So I can see here that a couple of these muscles are all attached. So let's explore that. How many people would this lamb of? One leg of lamb uh, will pro of, of this size will feed uh, four to six humans. The, the meat of, of lamb is pretty rich, which is what I like about it. I can feel the bone. I, I'm feeling it with the point of my knife, right? So let's take one of these bigger muscles off the bone, right? And all I'm doing is running the tip of my knife onto the bone. You can actually see that bone right there. And all I'm gonna do is now I'm pressing my knife on that bone. And I'm not cutting all the way through because sometimes muscles wrap around the bone, right? So I'm just gonna come here around this knuckle and I don't worry if I leave a little piece of meat like that on there, right? Cause I'm gonna take that and put that, something like that into my to be ground or used later pile. Can lamb be eaten raw? Oh yeah, delicious. As a matter of fact, um, uh, lamb kibinaya where you mix it with ground bulgur wheat uh, is maybe one of my favorite dishes in the whole world. And you know who makes the best version of it I've ever tasted? Besides some small shopkeepers in some countries in the Levant is Mike Solomonov, one of our country's greatest chefs. And I'm lucky he's a friend of mine. I've had a chance to have him actually make that dish for me because he knows how much I love it. Oh my God. So fantastic. Um, okay. So I'm just peeling this away. I mean, it's so easy if you let the lamb just do its talking for you. The muscle, the muscles will tell you where to cut. What knife are you using? It looks very sharp. Uh, it is very sharp. Uh, we keep our knives sharp. This is, this is a shun. And people are always, this is actually a great uh, point. Um, obviously I love Shun knives. I have a lot of them. And Shun knows that I collect a lot of knives. I have two, 300 of them. I have a set, I've been collecting pre-World War II Sabatier knives, a French knife uh, that I'm really fond of. Uh, because before World War II, they had silver on the bolsters and it's just a fun thing to collect if you're into knives. Um, but people are always talking about the expense of knives and they think that Shun is only uh, an expensive line of knives. It's not. Uh, Shun and its mother company, Kai, make 
so many different lines of knives, but just in the Shun pillar itself, this is, is this the Pro, Vicky? Yeah, this is the Pro, um, and it's their least expensive uh, knife, and it's absolutely fantastic. I love them. And it has a nice little scalloping there uh, that makes it very attractive to me. It holds an edge really well. They just have great, they just have great steel. What can I say? Um, so now I'm gonna take this bottom muscle off the bone. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about before was not only is it good to cook meat on the bone, but it's really, really good to save the bones. And right now I'm just, I'm just going in between the muscles. They just fall apart into my hands because they've got so much silver skin between them, right? Now, you know what that is? That's the knee, right? So we're not going to get in to breaking down the shank. You can crack it. But once you sort of figure out where the joint is, and I encourage you all to do that before you take a knife into it, just use the tip of your, I mean, I wasn't doing, I was literally applying no pressure at all because the, just the weight of this bone, which is not that big, will show me where it is. And if you like, You can then come down. I don't, I'm not a big fan of going through the muscles on the shanks. And I'm not a big fan of taking the shank off of, this is bone and cartilage, by the way. The bones are great for roasting and for sauces. But the best thing to do is just use your cleaver. Use this for stocks and soups. And yes, I know I'm a total nerd about this, but I will skin this because I, I like lamb burgers and I'll get, not only will I get a pound of trim here for like kebabs and stews and soups, uh, but I'll get another pound of this kind of stuff off the leg that I can put through uh, my KitchenAid grinder. So save your, save your bones. What kind of soup can you make with that? Oh, my favorite, uh, scotch barley, but I also do a lamb curry. I do a lamb with lentil, um, lamb with carrot and za'atar is great. Here you have, the shank of the lamb. And typically what I will do, and I'll, I have to go get a different cleaver. This is a thin edged cleaver. It will crack going through a bone this big. Um, always good to find the lamb hair. It means it's real. Um, but I take a heavier cleaver and a mallet and crack through it. Um, this shank is beautiful. It can feed a whole person if you braise it. The other thing that you can do, if you don't like braised lamb shanks, I don't know anyone in that category, take off the primary muscle on the shank. And again, it is riddled with silver skin that you have to just trim and pull away. But while the rest of the stuff is cooking, you can break this apart. It'll, there's like six or seven uh, long thin pieces of meat in there, or you can just trim off the tendon cut this into chunks and throw the whole thing right in the grinder, right? And then use this that has a little bit of meat on it. And again, if you're tuning in late, yes, I save these for shanks typically, but you can also simply cut these pieces of meat right off of there, trim them out just a little bit to get more of that connective tissue off and then use these to roast with some vegetables. 
drop them into a gallon of water and make the lamb stock that I'm gonna use for my super stew. Super, super easy. So these bones are actually gonna yield a lot of flavor and a lot of food in my kitchen, right? And I'll go through all of this, all of this trim, but I wanna focus on the big boys does, here. Does the age of the lamb affect the quality? Oh, what a great question. Yes, that's, you know, we sort of started out today by saying this is the season, right? Um, this is the season of spring lamb and goat for those that like to eat it. So I can sit, so not only is it pricey right now and then right after Easter, you'll see a dip in the price, especially in uh, American lamb and you'll start to see a lot of imported lamb uh, come in that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and you should take advantage of that. Um, but the young animal is so much tastier than the more mature animal. I've opened up this muscle here, the bottom round. It's a piece with big sinew on that. That's gonna go into my grind and stew pile. But if you just slide your knife through and just run this across here, I'm gonna, this is just silver skin. I'm gonna grind that. That's real silver skin. I'm not gonna grind that because that puts something into my grind that I don't want. But remember we talked before about those lines that separate the muscles? You can literally use your fingers or your knife and just follow those lines. I'm just pulling the lamb through. And then you can take your knife and just cut those pieces of silver skin out. You have all of this is just a light piece of connective tissue right here. It's got some tendons at the end, cut those off. But you get these beautiful strips of meat, right? And you can grill those, you can put them on kebabs, you can cut them into pieces and add them to this pile. And then you have the larger muscles of this bottom round. You can cut those in half, take away the tendons at the end. They're always at the end of the muscles, right? Remember your biology. Take these little pieces of fat off there so you have something really, really lean. And then these little steaks, right, become a really nice portion. This is gonna grind or roll up and go on kebabs. But something like this is really beautiful uh, to grill. And you can play the same game with this next piece. Just cut that off. This is the largest muscle on that bottom round. And later on, you can go in and trim this silver skin off or just take the larger pieces and just flick your knife through them so they don't make the lamb curl up when it's on your grill. And something like this that's a five ounce piece is a perfect portion just to grill and this will eat like a lamb chop, right? Now there's the shank. We can do the same thing with this largest piece which is the top round the shank piece there. But the top round is one that I usually try to grill in one big piece. I like to trim it so that when I slice it at the table, I have a nicer sort of effect for the plate and for my guest or guests. Do you smash it up to tenderize the meat? No, you don't have to. Spring lamb is so tender all on its own. So this, this piece of the top round, even those tiny little pieces that I would get persnickety on in a restaurant environment and trim off, at home, 
I would just throw this whole piece on the grill and it's about a pound and a half. And you can then slice it really, really, really beautifully. When you were talking about my favorite cuts, um, it's these two muscles right here. So for years, we would break down lamb legs in restaurants. These are right on the top of the lamb leg next to the top round. I'm sure they have fantastic Latin names that my friends who are real meat cutters are probably embarrassed right now saying, why aren't you remembering it? That's the sp Spinalis Allegotius. Um, but this is my favorite muscle in here. I was talking to Madeline before we started uh, our Instagram live. She said, what piece are you going to grill? I said, there's a, a tubular little muscle in here that is so tender and so perfect. I said, I'm probably going to grill this baby right here because it's going to be the perfect portion for our dish that we're going to make. Um, my second favorite, and again, just remove some of this silver skin and you'll note that there's really two muscles here. But if I cut it off, it's a thin line of silver skin, so it's not gonna be that tough. It's gonna take away from the appearance of this. And, you know, you always talk about what butchers save for themselves. Um, when I'm cutting legs of lamb and marinating them at home for like a mixed grill, if I'm going to do it off the bone, these are the two cuts right here that I save for myself. And you can see it's really two muscles, but this eats more like a skirt. This eats more like a tenderloin. I absolutely love them. Do they have the very, very tight, compact uh, structure that the top round does? No. Uh, or some of the center muscles of the bottom round? No. But they cook up so, so, so beautifully. Um, so let's very quickly, I'm gonna put a little bit of olive oil in my hands, roll this up here, and we're gonna get going and show you the rest of what we're doing. Uh, questions, comments, criticisms? Uh, can you cut those into medallions? Oh gosh, you can. Um, and I assume you mean, can you cut those into medallions for like sauteing or making a quick stir fry or a, um, a beef stroganoff or lamb stroganoff, I guess in this case, uh, where you would just brown them to medium rare and then add some onions and some wine and paprika and mushrooms and garlic and some fresh herbs like thyme and rosemary, which go perfectly uh, with lamb. Uh, yes, you can. Have you ever roasted lamb bones as like beef bones, roasted beef bones? Well, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, the, the idea behind taking them off the, taking all this stuff off is that I have pieces that I can grill up and trim and add to my, hey, this is part of my kebab pile, right? All this stuff I'm going to pick through, remove the cartilage, and big pieces of silver skin and grind it. And I'll come up with about a pound of ground meat. But those two big bones that we had are phenomenal for making, just brown them in the oven on a tray until they're nice and dark brown. And then an onion, a carrot, some celery sprigs, a couple cl cloves of garlic in a half gallon of water, lid on it, bring it to a simmer and just turn it down to maintain this eight, 12, 24 hours, whatever you like. Do it in a crock pot on low and you'll have a fantastic, fantastic uh, 
dark, earthy lamb broth that you can use to make a secondary dish, right? Like a sauce or something like that, or soup, whatever you like. It's great to have lamb stock around. It's delicious. Is venison similar cut-wise? Cut Absolutely. Well, it's the, a venison leg is <laughs> much darker and I hope much bigger. Otherwise, you're illegally shooting a very young animal. Uh, but you can butcher them the exact same. They're almost identical from a butchery standpoint in terms of the structure of the leg uh, itself. And I actually, the, the cuts that were the cut that I'm grilling here right now on a venison is my favorite cut from the leg as well. What is the maximum cooking temperature for lamb? What do you mean? Maybe like highest, like what's... What temperature should you make the lamb at? Oh, well, I mean, you know, 130 to 135 is, and then let it rest, uh, will bring it to a beautiful medium rare. As we said earlier, the thing about lamb that's so great uh, is that you can cook it uh, rare, medium rare, if that's how you like it, with a really hard sear, right? A charred hard sear on the outside, or you can cook it for a long time at a lower temperature. The meat's cooked well done, it's gray all the way through, but it's gonna just come right off the bone and melt in your mouth. How to cook a bone in leg of lamb? Bone in leg of lamb, super simple. I rub mine with mustard, salt, and pepper. I make some holes in it with a sharp knife. I put herb sprigs, mint, garlic slivers, and throw it on the grill indirect. Roast it if you have a thermometer and you're grilling indirect. I, I usually go at about 325 to 375, anywhere in that range, for about three hours. Uh, what can I serve with lamb besides mint? Oh, you don't, you don't, it, it's, oh, it, mint is a superbly complimentary herb for lamb, especially fresh mint, which is why I have a salad that has mint in it that's gonna go on top of my lamb. Uh, but so, I mean, Lamb with barley, with couscous, uh, with, uh, with, with spelt, with, with gnocchi. I mean, there's nothing lamb doesn't, anything that you would pair any red meat with, lamb goes with beautifully. Remember, older lamb has a slightly more barnyardy quality to it than younger lamb. So if you start to get into the mutton category, it's a very, very, it's a stronger lamb flavor. So you're gonna wanna temper it with acids. So. Uh, sherry wine vinegar sauces, citrus sauces. Uh, it's why uh, roasted leg of lamb, an older lamb with avgalamono, an egg and lemon sauce, first started in Greece so many thousands of years ago. What are you grilling your lamb on? Uh, this is a very small Japanese uh, grill, and I'm doing it over binshotan, which is a compressed uh, Japanese charcoal. Um, if you live in an apartment building and you have a hood and you want to grill over very, these, these binshotan charcoal pieces will uh, essentially be smokeless while they're preheating as opposed to American compressed charcoal. Uh, and uh, they don't generate, uh, American charcoal doesn't generate as much heat. So this is very, very, very high heat searing. This is the, this is the setup of yakitori bars all over the world. In fact, uh, this is the smallest size that these little chondros come in. They will get bigger, 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 bigger. I've had a three footer on order, back order, waiting, waiting all throughout COVID. Um, you have a little window here so you can open up the, the airflow to get into where the charcoal is. Um, but you can see, for anyone who's ever grilled lamb over charcoal before, that by taking all of the fat and silver skin off, I don't have any drippings that create sooty flare up, but that's also because of the very, very high heat of this charcoal is actually, even though it's not blackening it, is putting such a nice crust on it, everything is staying inside. I'm gonna let this rest, and we're gonna make a really, really special dish uh, for you in just a couple of seconds. All right, uh, let's begin that process, shall we? Um, so recipe is on our website. Um, this to me is 
my favorite sauce of spring. I could literally eat this like pudding out of a bowl in front of a football game. It's tonato sauce. Uh, tonato, tono, Italian for tuna. Um, it is simply a puree of ingredients, capers, lemon, anchovies, mayonnaise, and really good tuna. Um, this tuna uh, right here, uh, I'm assuming is Portuguese. Nope, Spanish. Um, Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, all harvest uh, tuna from the Mediterranean, um, and then they can it or jar it. Um, the reason their tuna is so moist and so fantastic is that it's cooked in the tins and jars that uh, you get them in with olive oil. It's cooked once. And some of the most skilled artisans in the whole world actually put a mixture of raw cuts in there. So you have a little belly, a little... So it's a nice mix. Um, on Bizarre Foods, I've told tuna canning stories and fish canning stories uh, out the wazoo. So I, I've been inside those factories. Uh, America, the, the, the tuna companies right now that, uh, you know, big tuna, uh, I'm not a big fan of. The, the, the tuna is cooked, then it's put into a, a pouch or a can or a jar, and it's, it's cooked a second time to make it shelf stable. Um, that's why it's dry and you gotta add a lot of mayonnaise to it. Um, when I'm doing a Niswa's salad and I use this tuna, I just pull the tuna right out and just lay it on the top and I have my dressing, all my vegetables to make that dish. Um, this is also the tuna that I make tuna fish salad uh, with. I use much less mayonnaise. I use a lot less of everything and it tastes more like real fish. Um, these days, uh, I am trying really hard to know which companies are using what type of tuna because so many tuna species are being overfished. Um, my friend Alexandra Cousteau likes to say that um, eating a bluefin tuna these days is like eating a tiger. That's how, that's how rare they are in the ocean, why the price has skyrocketed up and why you should be eating much smaller uh, uh, tuna that are uh, more plentiful species like uh, uh, black tuna in the Caribbean or other jacks or uh, albacore species that uh, run in much bigger numbers. Um, so, and get them from a reliable resource, not some like giant tuna company. Um, let me just pull this and I'm just gonna rest my meat there for five, six minutes while I assemble the rest of the dish. So this tonato sauce goes with everything. And instead of just having it with slices of cold poached veal, Vitello tonato, one of my favorite dishes in the whole world, slices of cold poached veal, tuna sauce above it and below it, olives, capers, lemons, herbs, delicious. Then I started making it with slices of cold poached chicken. Then I started making it with slices of room temperature grilled turkey. Then I started doing it with slices of pork. Then I started doing tuna tonato, where I would take tuna, sear it and put a tuna sauce underneath it and put a salad on top of it. Then I started doing it with beef. Then I would have leftovers and I would literally just smear my finger inside it. I would dip chips in it. There is no, I use this sauce as a dip for a, a chopped vegetable salad. There's, th this sauce is so multi-purpose. Um, and all I want to do is put, well, let me do one side first is just put a smear of sauce on one side. And then I'm gonna put a smear of sauce on the other. And I'm just gonna come around and come up and kind of like some of those zhuzhes in my, I just wanna coat the bottom of this. You're not going to see the bottom of the plate. So by all means, who cares about there? I just care about having a nice light appearance on the top. We're going to set that aside. 
Now, cilantro leaves, mint leaves, cucumber slices. This is a Persian cucumber, those little ones that are now available in six packs everywhere. I love them because of their size. Now you're getting into the summer season. I know there, there are actually some states in the South and out in California where young cucumbers are coming off the vine. So of course you can use those. Um, I make this at the last minute because the, um, the dressing with lime juice and fish sauce and sugar is so acidic it will break down the leaves and the cucumbers so quickly that I like to wait to the last minute to actually dress this salad. Um, let me show you, this is dirty. Um, I'm just gonna take some thin slices of this red Fresno chili, set that aside. I like to use all of the pepper, so I just cut out that side and then use my fingers to take out any pieces of seed and filament. And then I'm just gonna cut this into strips. chop this really fine. I don't want to make paste out of it, but I want to put, yeah, that's about a tablespoon of chili into there. And I've got this other little piece of trim. Gather that. Pass your knife a couple times over that. Just so it all is chopped and looks the same. And then I'm going to take this jalapeno By the way, on a red Fresno and a jalapeno, the part of the chili that has the least amount of heat to it is the tip before you reach the seeds. So a slice there is going to be about half as spicy as a slice an inch further on. And in fact, you can usually eat them, I wouldn't call it sweet, but it's sweeter. And that's gonna be my garnish. You know, I had this tomato also. And I could peel it, but I just take the seed pod out, cut it in half, cut each half in half. And the reason I do that is then I have four pieces with some nice points on them, right? Use that to garnish as well. Uh, and I'm just gonna dissolve the sugar in the lime juice and the fish sauce. Can you marinate lamb? Of course you can. Uh, lamb marinates beautifully. Um, I love marinating lamb and yogurt and then grilling it is absolutely fantastic. Um, we have uh, our spice blends there, uh, yogurt and our madras curry or yogurt and our Moroccan moon with lamb is about as good as it gets. Shameless plug, you can get it at Walmart or order it from badiaspices.com. I think it's, it's available also in ShopRite in the Northeast and coming to more stores very shortly. So once that sugar has dissolved, and please make sure it's dissolved, just drop some on your hand and taste it. Does it need, need more lime juice? Does it need more, what does it need a little more of, right? That, 
I think that's absolutely perfect. You may like yours a little limeier. You may want yours to have a little more sugar in it, although it's sort of the, the holy ratio. And yes, recipes for all of this is, are on the website at andrewzimmern.com. And now it's time to assemble our dish, right? So I'm gonna put my garnish over here. I'm gonna grab a cutting board because I completely forgot I had some raw lamb on here, although it was so, um, I take cross-contamination really seriously and so should you. However, with freshly butchered lamb, I'm not really worried about it since no one's really eating this, but, but me, and it's so fresh, I'm not worried about it, but make sure that you are avoiding that. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna cut this into thin slices. And we told you this is like a little tenderloin. So all we're gonna do is cut straight down that rested to a pale pink. Now, every cut of the lamb leg has a different color. If we grilled the top round to the same temperature, it would be dark red in the middle. This is the palest colored muscle on the leg. And I am a big fan of not putting the ends on things unless I can hide them in the middle. And so all I want to do is spin this around on my cutting board. And then place that down into the middle of our bowl. Oh yeah, that's really good. And then very lightly dress this salad. It's just herbs and shallots and cucumber. It does not need, it's got the hot chili. Do not put salt. I already salted the lamb. The tuna sauce is already seasoned. And in the recipe for there, it tells you to make it and then taste it. Because depending on where you get your tuna from, it is going to be very well seasoned also. The salad recipe makes enough for three or four portions of this. So all we're going to do is put a little mound of our salad on top of there. You may want to pull an extra slice or two on top. And I, I tell you something, you know, a little bit of tomato, just so everyone has a nice little cool, acidic, pop to it. That, my friends, is as, as good as food gets. And I know that this looks super fancy. The sauce is all made in a food processor. It's five ingredients and you stick it away and it lasts for days in your fridge. The lamb, you just pull a piece out and grill it. It could be a chop. It could be, you know, one muscle it doesn't have to be that one. You don't have to dress it individually. Right? I plated this the way I would in a restaurant. You can grill up all these pieces, pass the sauce at the table, a nice, you know, steamed broccoli or something, and then pass this as the, you know, the garnish salad that goes on top of the lamb. I like this salad because it's crispy and it's crunchy and it's got that antiseptic flavor of the mint that cuts through the richness of the lamb. Questions, comments, criticisms? Mmm. 
An apple salad would be lovely with this. Dress it the same way. Or add apples to the cucumbers. Or a, a slightly tart plum. This salad is so good you can just eat it on its own. Best seasonings and marinades to use with lamb? Depends what you want to make. I just put salt and pepper on that and olive oil and grilled it. It's delicious. Young spring lamb doesn't need a lot. However, I will take these home. I will throw them in a bag with a few cups of yogurt, the juice of a couple lemons, and three or four or five tablespoons of our Madras curry blend or our Moroccan moon blend and let that sit for a day. What's today? Thursday. Let it sit for two days and grill it up for dinner on Saturday night. Is there another type of base sauce you would recommend with lamb? Oh my God, anything. I mean, with lamb, you can make any sort of chutney. It pairs so well with sweet and sour things. Any sort of vegetable chutney. I'll take uh, pineapple wedges, cut them up, uh, cook it down almost to like a jam with a few cups of uh, rum in there, some sliced chilies, a few tablespoons of soy and put that underneath it. And, and look, you can buy a traditional mango chutney. I always keep a jar of mango chutney in my refrigerator in case I quickly have a grilled piece of meat that needs something with it and I am not making anything else with it. Maybe I'm just a bowl of rice, some sliced meat, and that's it. Favorite vegetable to cook with to turn a simple meal into an outstanding... Artichokes. I knew where that question was going. Nothing turns an ordinary dinner into something. Fa just seeing an artichoke is just fantastic. Last question. Where do you get Boxers. Lambs? Where do you get lambs from? That's, a, that's an American joke, Vicky. It's because right. everyone's always asking guys what kind of underwear mm. they have, boxers or briefs. Boxers. All right, well, I'm glad we got that answered. Vicky is glad that we got that answered. <laughs> Madeline just sits there and laughs. She just thinks I'm ridiculous. Uh, any like trip tricks to kind of find like good lamb? Like where do you buy it? Or yes, where? we got this at a local butcher shop. The, it, connect through the smallest local purveyor that you can find. I do not buy lamb anywhere, even the supermarket, if they can't tell me where it's from and who grew it. Now, what's really cool, we have grocery chains here in Minnesota, big and small, that know that the number one pillar for food buyers is transparency. And that number is growing every year as older folks age out who don't understand transparency and younger people come in who make, or their number one thing is transparency. So even at the chain grocery stores here in Minnesota, there are signs that tell you where it's from. They have pictures of it. They, there are barcodes that you can scan and actually get pictures on your phone of the farms, which I think is really cool. I think consumers want that. Consumers want that. Andrew, you promised singing. I did not see Ba Ba Black Sheep. I was trying to think of a lamb song. I did not sing, but next time I promise you, uh, I will sing. Maybe next week I'll bring my guitar in and I'll play a little ditty. How's that? Singing and a ditty. Anyway, do me a favor. I know this looks fancy. Try it. Make the sauce, make the salad, grill up a piece of lamb. For those of you that want to, buy a couple legs next week when the price goes down, bone them out, freeze it, make some lamb uh, stock with the bones, grind the trim for lamb burgers. You're gonna save a ton of money and eat like a king for the next eight weeks. I love you people. See you next time.